Excellencies and Ambassadors, distinguished guests and delegates, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm Fatima, currently working as a research assistant here at Beeps. Today, I welcome you all to the Beeps Round Table on UN Peacekeeping at 75, The Road Ahead. The moderator for today's round table is Major General ANM Muniruzaman, NDC, PSC, President Beeps. And the speakers of today's round table are Dr. Iftikhar Ahmed Chaudhuri, Distinguished Fellow, Beeps. He is a former Bangladesh advisor of foreign affairs to the government of Bangladesh. Lieutenant General, and our second speaker is Lieutenant General Abdul Hafiz, NDC, PSC. He served as the Chief of General Staff of Bangladesh Army. Mr. Hafiz served as a force commander in UN operation in Ivory Coast and in Western Sahara. He was a military observer in the UN Iraq Kuwait Observer Mission. And our third speaker is Dr. Nilay Ronjan Bishash, Associate Professor, Department of International Relations, University of Tata. He completed his PhD in international politics from City University of London. His current research interests include policy, security governance, and South Asian contributions in UN peace support missions. Now, I would like to request the moderator to continue the rest of the session. Thank you. Furthermore, thank you very much. <coughs> and Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you again to the BIFS round table that we hold every month. And this month our topic is UN Peacekeeping at 75, the road ahead. It is most significant for us to talk on the issue because we are observing the 75th year of UN Peacekeeping operations. For the last 75 years, UN Peacekeeping has been one of the most important tools for mitigating conflict and promoting peace around the world. Helping countries navigate the difficult path from conflict to peace, peacekeeping has unique strengths, including legitimacy, burden sharing, and ability to deploy and sustain troops and police from around the world, integrating them with civilian peacekeepers to advance multi-dimensional mandates. Bangladesh, as you know, is one of the principal contributors to peacekeeping operations for many years. And as we speak here today, we are the number one contributor with over 7,500 peacekeepers deployed around the world. The event today has 12 peacekeeping operations actively in different conflict zones with over 90,000 peacekeepers. This has been a major contribution of the UN to international peace and stability. And we are extremely happy that Bangladesh has played a key role in contributing to the process. Today we have an excellent panel of people who have both conceptual, diplomatic, and ground experience to talk about issues. And without further ado, I will first hand, hand over the floor to Dr. Iftikhar Rahman Chaudhary. As you heard, Dr. Iftikhar Rahman Chaudhary was a foreign affairs advisor to the government of Bangladesh, or in effect, the Bangladeshi foreign minister. He is currently also a distinguished fellow at BIPS. So with that introduction, Dr. Chaudhary, you have the floor for the next 10 minutes. Thank you, General Munir. Uh, well, uh, Thank you so much for the intro and uh, also uh, I just wanted to uh, tell you that uh, what I am about to say uh, is come from my personal exposure and experience of, uh, of peacekeeping and peace building. Uh, I, have, I was associated from Kepto I mean, right from the start when, uh, when Bangladesh joined the uh, peacekeeping operations after uh, 598 uh, Walk, uh, after the Iraq Iran war. I was uh, for many years uh, initially deputy and then permanent representative of both in New York and, and in Geneva, and therefore connected with their operations till, till I laid down my office in, as foreign advisor in 2009. Now, as the Greek philosopher uh, Heraclitus had said, that all the world is in a flux, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, you never step into the same river twice. Uh, that is also the case with. Uh, UN peacekeeping. 
Its forces, quite uh, deservedly, were awarded the UN Peace, uh, uh, Peace Nobel Peace Prize in, uh, in 1988. Maybe it was called the UN Peace Prize. Uh, its nature is always uh, evolving, the nature of peacekeeping, that is. Initially, during the Cold War period, lightly armed peacekeepers were deployed with the consent of the parties to observe a ceasefire uh, in place on the ground uh, and objectively report compliance. By the end of the Cold War in the late 1980s, peacekeeping was transformed into a more complex operation. Uh, missions were being sent out to help implement comprehensive peace agreement between protagonists in intrastate conflicts, uh, uh, but with, with their consent. Over time, these operations came to involve more and more non-military elements, such as police officers and civilian personnel, to buttress the military presence. The functions were widened beyond their implementation of peace, uh, uh, peacekeeping to include uh, DDRR, which stands for Disarmament, Demobilization, Reintegration and Rehabilitation, CBMs, Confidence Building Measures, Power Sharing Arrangements, and Electoral Support, Strengthening the Rule of Law and Economic and Social Development. The Secretariat in New York was restructured accordingly with UN Peacekeeping Department created in 1992. Participation of member states in peacekeeping operations has been enthusiastic. Troop contributions, this report, new helmets, have been drawn mainly from developing countries such as Bangladesh, <coughs> India, Pakistan, Nepal, Rwanda, and Nigeria as well, while wealthier member states such as the United States bear the funding costs of the nearly U.S. $7 billion budget. Uh, the, the, the U.S. is providing 25%, but I think they, the, uh, they were meant to uh, provide 27, uh, 28.7 or something, but there's a, there's a congressional cap on U.S. contributions, so it's 25%. And which is more than double the regular U.N. Uh, annual budget, which is around $3.4 billion. So you see the U.N. Budget is 3.4 and peacekeeping budget is nearly 7 billion dollars. So PKOs or peacekeeping operations over the last seven and a half decades have evolved through four avatars or generations that I'm sure others will address. But suffice it is to say that we are currently at the fourth generation, the so-called robust peacekeeping, which is permission to use force to enhance civilian tasks, which also acts as a protection. A mechanism for peacekeepers. PKOs, peacekeeping operations, have a mix of success stories. Success stories would be East Timor, Sierra Leone, Liberia, El Salvador, Cote d'Ivoire, and Mozambique. And Cote d'Ivoire was something that to Tunisia was very much involved with. And uh, just before the uh, meeting today, I was talking to them about. How it all began the process when we had our initial launch with uh, uh, Jean Marie Gehenno, who was the, the uh, 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 Under Secretary General, and the French ambassador, who, as you can imagine, is a tremendous say in everything that happens in Central Africa. Failures with Somalia and the tragic genocide in Rwanda in 1994 and massacres of Srebrenica in Bosnia in 1995. In place, uh, in places, there were also reports of misdemeanors by troops. All the steps towards isolating such flaws and improving efficiency, the Brahimi report deserves special mention. The Brahimi panel recommended the establishment of the Peace Building Commission and a Peace Building Support Office to assess uh, to assist. Now, I was involved with the conceptual, conceptualizing of the process of the trap from peacekeeping to peace building, to which I should speak in a moment. Uh, which I did as, uh, in 2005 as a UN facilitator under the then 
via President uh, uh, Jean Ping, uh, when the Peace Building Commission, which is the PBC, was set up, of which Bangladesh became a member initially. And incidentally, at that point in time, 2005, uh, it was Bangladesh, India, uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh were all members of the PBC, which is something uh, strange in a, in a UN system where there is a usually a geographical distribution among uh, members of groups, but in this degree, of, uh, the Commission decided to have all the major South Asian countries come to the UN. Now, what is this peace building? It pertains to the efforts of the United Nations to assist countries and regions in their transition from war to peace and to reduce a uh, country's risk of uh, lapsing or relapsing back into conflict. It is perpetrated to be achieved by strengthening national capacities for conflict management and by laying the foundations for sustainable peace. It involves prevention, management, and resolution of conflict. Peace building becomes strategic when it, uh, when it works over the long run and at all levels of society to establish and sustain relationships amongst people locally and globally. And in this, uh, rule, uh, rule of law and human rights components are extremely, extremely critical. Uh, now, you see, um, <coughs> Just as preventive diplomacy seeks to resolve a dispute before violence breaks out and peacemaking and peacekeeping halt conflicts and preserve peace once attained, peace building is designed to prevent the recurrence of violence or the backsliding from peace back to conflict. The hope was it would create a positive as opposed to negative peace, a stable social equilibrium uh, in which the surfacing of new disputes will not escalate into violence or war. It is said that a peacekeeping operation that does not incorporate peace building uh, is to use a biblical expression like uh, constructing a house upon shifting sands. <coughs> uh, there were criticisms, of course, Structures uh, uh, in, in, in configuration in, in New York. Johann Galtung, a thought leader in this area for decades, uh, uh, argued that the presence of permanent members of the Security Council in the PDC, with their leveraging power, as an, is an impediment in progress and designed to favor conventional real politique. In other words, it sort of crystallizes the real politique. The ground, we have permanent members of the Security Council and veto powers and members of PBC. Uh, uh, Jan Nair, another relevant critic, went further. He uh, thought uh, it, uh, uh, it was a hypocritical interest in, uh, in the developed countries and a hypocritical interest in peacekeeping and peace building, in that the major uh, wealthy countries were also pursuing these uh, objectives in countries where they were also setting arms. Much of the criticism also flowed from compromises that were needed to be made to bring the PDC off the ground. In any negotiations, there is always a price to pay when the lowest common denominator is sought. Despite the negatives, Australian colleague Gareth Evans, all of you are aware, has said that the goal set can be achieved if all configurations that is not in the field that are agile, flexible, and fast moving. So the goal is to replace the spiral of violence with the spiral of peace and development. This is what this really aims at. In focus, in attempting to do this, there are at least three dimensions that need to be addressed. First, structural, second, relational, and third, personal. As to, uh, as to the structural dimension, causes of conflict must be carefully identified and peace-enhancing 
remedial measures in, in, in the days. According to Michelle Miles, focus should be electoral and constitutional reforms, identifications of lead persons in the community, human rights and rule of law mechanisms, and micro and macro socio-economic activities. The second, a relational dimension should entail reducing war-related hostility through repair and transformation of damaged relationships. Parties should acknowledge and responsible uh, acknowledge responsibility and seek forgiveness and reconciliation through mechanisms such as truth and reconcil uh, reconciliation commissions. Of course, we learned in uh, South Africa providing an excellent example of this. Bridge building. Mass communications can also play an effective role. Future imaging, that is having a shared vision of where the community can go together, will render things easier. To address the third or personal dimension, the individual who has experienced trauma must be helped through a process of healing. Victim empowerment. Concept. Victim empowerment should be a key endeavor. Throughout the peace building process, it should be important to create peace constituencies. Constituency meaning groups of people in the community who are supporting for the peace endeavors because it redounds to their benefit as well. Middle range actors such as teachers, lawyers, religious leaders can often function as links between the grassroots and elite levels. John Paul Lederach's model of hierarchical interventions, a sociological concept, can be applied at various levels. In order to kickstart the process, quick impact projects, that is QIPs, quick impact projects involving civil society organizations such as NGOs, can be considered across a broad spectrum of activities. Peace building, therefore, is an idea whose time has come. The challenge would be to, to dovetail it with peacekeeping and also peacemaking. If that can be done, the whole series of complementary activities can be can resolve intramural conflicts in societies, prevent their recurrence, and move affected humanity to a, along the path of peace, stability, justice, equity, and development. As the UN revamps itself, this is the moment of the international community to <coughs> resolutely all these questions. Or else, the world's yearning for stability would result in a never-ending wait, just like that of Samuel Beckett's famous fictional work, Waiting for Godot. The wait for Godot, as you all know, was in vain because Godot never actually comes. <laughs> As you heard, Jem Hafiz is Bangladesh's one of the most experienced peacekeeper. Having been the force commander in two different missions, he has had long experience both in the field and the process of the academic aspects of peacekeeping. So, please give the floor for the next 10 minutes. Thank you very much, General Munir Zaman, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning. Indeed, today we are very proud of 
the achievements of the Lutherites in the last uh, 75 years. And very rightly, uh, the moderator, Jamal Zaman, has mentioned that that today one of the most feasible and uh, most primary tools the UN employs to maintain international peace and security is peacekeeping. And uh, also from the expose of uh, Dr. Ifsikhan and the Chaudhary, we have come to know how from the initial days of observing ceasefire between two or more warring parties, peacekeeping has evolved and expanded to perform multi-dimensional complex missions. And Dr. Chaudhary has also mentioned the dramatic rise of the UN's involvement in multidimensional peacekeeping after the uh, end of the Cold War. And he also mentioned a number of success stories during that period. He mentioned about Namibia, Angola, Cambodia, El Salvador, Mozambique. These are something that the world community should be proud of because they helped to build foundations of durable peace and stability. This was the time, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, that UN was not a bystander to civil wars and humanitarian catastrophes as it is today. And I would like to mention that except for the debacles, which also was mentioned by uh, Dr. Chaudhary, debacles in, uh, in Rwanda for failing to stop the genocide, which killed about 800,000 Tutsis, and the debacle in Srebrenica, generally speaking, most of the UN's peacekeeping endeavors were successful. But what we are seeing today after 75 years, there was a, there was a quotation made, um, made by uh, Dr. Chaudhary, by a Greek philosopher, the, all, all the world is in a flask. I would like to say that peacekeeping is in a flux today. It is now under great pressure because its three large stabilization operations in Central African Republic, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo and Mali are facing multiple difficulties in delivering their mandate. Today, the overall peacekeeping scenario looks ominous. It is bleak, it is very green. Why is it so? Firstly, never before in the history of peacekeeping, the blue barracks were targeted so systematically by armed groups as it is the case in the last 10 years. Peacekeepers coming under attack by spoilers, by militants, by opportunists who are opposed to peace is nothing new. It happened since the dawn of peacekeeping. But the number of malicious acts taking place against peacekeepers since 2013, last 10 years, is unprecedented. And the vast majority of killings are occurring in the three countries that I just mentioned. For 10 consecutive years, the UN mission in Mali has been the deadliest in the world for peacekeepers with 172 fatalities caused by militants through their attacks on the peacekeepers since the last 10 years. And these conditions are not allowing the peacekeepers to fulfill their mandate. In Mali, for example, two-thirds of the mission's 13,000 strong force is engaged, is focused on self-protection. They are protecting themselves. But they are mandated to protect civilians and they are also mandated to perform other very important tasks. Secondly, in these countries, we are witnessing conflicts that are deeply, deeply entrenched. These are running for many years and there is no end to violence in sight in the near future. It has to be underlined that peacekeepers, they essentially go to keep peace. That is their responsibility. They go, they deploy and they keep peace. But we have been seeing that there is no peace to keep in Mali in DRC and in Central African Republic. These countries with multidimensional peacekeeping are going through huge turmoil ever since their deployment. The peace process is either stalled or absent or very slow. Thirdly, in each of these countries, a number of groups, a number of parties, political movements are outside the peace process. They are not in the peace process. These, they are using terror and asymmetric tactics to realize their political and economic goals. With attacks against civilians being a regular phenomenon, the security situation is absolutely precarious. But the most critical of all difficulties, the most critical, 
is that these operations are experiencing crisis of concept both with the host governments and local populations. The very purpose with which these missions were deployed is far from being achieved. It is evident that at 75 years of peacekeeping we are discussing today, UN's reputation, UN's image in its flagship enterprise are in serious jeopardy. You have reason to ask why did its 6.3 billion US dollar annual budget and why after so many years of lessons learned the peacekeeping operations are failing to deliver on their mandates and failing to protect civilians who look to them for safety. When I look at the situation as a, as a former force commander, I find that the root causes and conflict drivers have not been effectively addressed in these countries. When I was in Ivory Coast, I found that the country was relapsing. It was coming back into conflict whenever the peace process was not moving forward. The two warring parties, the two belligerents started fighting. Our contact, our communication, dialogue, meetings with the two belligerents were good for building confidence. It was good for bringing them together. But only military and technical engagements cannot bring lasting peace. Looking back in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, in Ivory Coast, conflicts were resolved through a political process, duly addressing the grievances of all protagonists and not through forceful or military means. It has to be underlined that without visible progress on finding an inclusive political arrangement in these countries, peace and stability will be a far cry. Today, it is a very pertinent question. What is the future? What is going to happen to UN's multidimensional peacekeeping operations? This has to be seen in the light of some relevant developments. Very relevant developments. First, the 2008 deployment of 20,000, the second largest UN operation, the African Union UN troops in Darfur, had to be closed down 13 years later in December 2000 because the mission had no apparent impact on the peace negotiation. Second, UN's largest peace operation, MONUSCO, in Democratic Republic of the Congo, failed to build legitimacy and concern among the ordinary people who are most affected by the conflict. Last year, protesters calling for MONUSCO's withdrawal, they attacked mission bases in several cities. Over 30 Congolese civilians and four peacekeepers were killed. They were asking MONUSCO to leave. The government of Congo has been trying to get the mission to leave since 2010, 13 years. They are asking, go, no need. Third, in a latest blow, six days ago, on 16 June, Mali's military government has asked the UN to withdraw its peacekeeping mission from the country without delay on the floor of the Security Council because he accuses that it is failing to respond to security needs of Mali. The fate of MINUSMA now hangs on a balance because the head of the mission has said conducting UN peacekeeping operations was nearly impossible without the consent of the host country. We are going to see within the, in the next one week or so whether this, this mission is going to be extended after 30th June. Fourth development, in spite of the fact that compared to the 1990s, the rate of civil wars has nearly tripled in the past decade and that resulted in a nearly six times increase in battle deaths. It is very surprising that the UN has not deployed any new multidimensional peacekeeping operation since 2014. Last nine years, there has been no deployment of UN multidimensional peacekeeping, even though the rate of civil wars has increased many fold. Fifth and the last, the near, there is a near absence of peacekeeping in Secretary General's Our Common Agenda report, which was published in 2021. This is a stark illustration of his lack of enthusiasm for the tool. It appears that his own views may pull the organization away from large scale missions. So, what is the road ahead? What are we going to see with regard to multidimensional peacekeeping operations? in the days to come. One idea is that the era of large-scale peacekeeping operation is coming to a close because of the, of the series of debacles that I have mentioned. The other idea is exactly opposite. In view of the continued violence against civilians by terrorists and other non-state armed groups, there are suggestions that the UN should go big. 
means that you will should be more aggressive by putting in more troops on the ground, more boots on the ground. It means that peacekeepers conduct offensive operations against terrorist troops. This is an expectation that peacekeepers are unable to meet as most of their capabilities are dedicated to self-protection that I have mentioned. Moreover, TCCs, the troop contributing countries, are opposed to the idea of putting their troops in the line of fire to wage war in the name of peacekeeping. UN Secretary General Guterres has recalled, and I quote, a peacekeeping operation is not an army or a counter-terrorist force or a humanitarian agency. It is a tool to create the space for a nationally owned political solution, unquote. Therefore, Ladies and gentlemen, it is most likely that in the coming days, we are not going to see stabilization within peacekeeping because overly militarized responses fail to deal with the drivers of conflict and have not been effective in facilitating sustainable peace. 75 years of peacekeeping experience has shown that one of the key factors that influences its effectiveness is whether there is a viable political project in place. So we are probably going to see peacekeeping operation for monitoring ceasefire, for giving support to a peace process that has a clear political roadmap, a clear political objective, and a clear exit strategy. When an inclusive political project involving all protagonists is not there, the Council and the Member States shall be looking beyond peacekeeping to other tools at its disposal. In the coming days, therefore, we are going to see special political missions with lighter footprint as we are seeing in Yemen, as we are seeing in Colombia, as we are seeing in Sudan. We are going to see peacemaking using special envoys to pursue ceasefire and peace agreements. We are also going to see more regional and sub-regional arrangements, like mandating the African Union or mandating the ECOWAS to act on UN's behalf. Lastly, today more than a quarter of world population, nearly 2 billion people, are affected by armed conflict. And we would like to believe, as the peoples of the United Nations, we would like to believe that the UN remains the best actor to maintain international peace and security. Thank you very much. Avish, thank you very much for giving us that understanding of the current challenges that many conflicts pose to international peace and security in general and to international peacekeepers in particular. It is also understood that the uh, years of multidimensional peacekeeping has to be rethought. Because in many places, multidimensional peacekeeping, as you know, is not really playing the role for which it was intended. But the whole process of peacekeeping has evolved, has gone through a process of evolution. From first generation in peacekeeping, we are now entering the fourth generation of peacekeeping. So the generation changes has also brought about much changes in the way we operate, in the way we find the end states of our missions. As Dr. Chaudhary mentioned about peace building, peace building is a critical process of peacekeeping now, especially for peace sustenance. And as General Fies mentioned, that unless you have process of peace sustenance, then conflicts relapse. And we completely negate the process of sustaining peace. Our next speaker is Dr. Deloy Ranjan Bishash, who is an associate professor in the Department of International Relations in Dhaka University. But more than that, he has done some very fundamental work on the various concepts of peacekeeping and has been working with the Bangladesh Army and PIPSO for many years. So, he is very well qualified to give us an understanding of the process of evolution and where the concepts of peacekeeping lie today. So, we allow you the floor. Thank you so much, sir. And good morning, everyone. Sanku. And it's um, <coughs> really overwhelming and a very um, learning experience for me to listen uh, uh, to um, excellent speakers, particularly who have wide experience in the diplomatic and on the um, uh, implementation of uh, peacekeeping globally uh, for Bangladesh and also at the global stages at the different um, 
capacities. Mm -hmm. So what um, I have been doing is uh, from the civilian academic perspective, um, so some of us who have been studying the peacekeeping contribution of the South Asian countries, particularly Bangladesh in the last um, 10 years, and particularly our experience from uh, 1988 and onwards. And one thing from the contributor's perspective, contribute, contribution to the event peacekeeping uh, operations uh, will remain incomplete if we do not place the contributions in the more global perspective of the event peacekeeping operations. Both um, if Tegersar and you know, Hafizah has, has quite eloquently explained the situations at the current moment and also that as a legacy from the history as well, particularly why the United Nations peacekeeping operations is at the, at the current stage in the, in the last 75 years and what the situations over there. Now, I would like to put this in a very um, um, interesting framework, which is the local uh, competitivity, or one can particularly say, in because United Nations peacekeeping operations has provided an opportunity uh, for many countries' forces troops and police forces, civilians, to um, kind of like, you know, experience uh, uh, a very interesting global and local norms that we should not for, uh, you know, forget at all. Uh, so the understanding of establishing peace, then contextualizing peace in the local context where the missions are implemented, and at the same time, when the contributing countries are deploying the troops and uh, police forces and also civilians, uh, they are also adopting some of the global norms, contextualizing or localizing some of these norms. Um, you know, first of all, I think you know the very issue that has been on the uh, hot spot is the idea of the principles of the event peacekeeping operation. So we all understand that the significance of consent, we all understand the significance of the, the, the use of force uh, and at the same time neutrality as opposed to the idea of um, um, in a, um, ineffectiveness or uh, you know, particularly when we talk about Rwanda cases opposed to which was a very interesting paradigm shift and even started moving forward after that as well. So I think when we talk about or compare a case, for example, Liberia versus a very contemporary case of Democratic Republic of Congo or uh, Mali, then we can understand that how the principle of consent has been constantly uh, on the hotspot and particularly even has struggled to, 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 to be uh, consistent on, on, on accepting consent and maintaining neutrality, but unfortunately or in practice on the ground, there were challenges on this principle. So it was a very difficult scenario for United Nations, particularly to address with this very global norm of maintaining consent and neutrality at the same time, you know, addressing the practical challenges on the field, which is quite different from the 20th century peacekeeping experiences. Uh, both the previous speakers were talking about the transformations. I think this is very significant for us to understand. So from peacekeeping to peace building, I think there is one important change that has happened is the chapter seven operations of peace enforcement. So of course, the, the contemporary cases, or even if we consider the cases which has been there in the first decade of the 21st century, I mean, there were hard day situations where the troops were sent, there were peace to keep. It was basically an enforcement from the top-down approaches and more uh, you know, use of forces or practical uses of forces to protect the mandate and, and self-defense were allocated considering the practical scenarios over there. So in that context, use of force, which is the third principle of the event peacekeeping operation, has also been testified quite significantly based on the context of the different operations as well. And even still has to kind of balance or or address those challenges, particularly in missions like Mali, where you know French led different operations were were there before to, to handle the situations of the terrorist crisis. And the United Nations is still dealing with the crisis that they, the, the, the counter-terrorism is not demanded of the United Nations, but United Nations forces has to face that. And it is one of the deadliest missions. Obviously, for that reason, that UN is targeted, UN forces are targeted for the, for the objective that they were not supposed to do, uh, which is uh, fighting the terrorism cases. And these kind of situations will probably evolve in future as well. So in future as well, the challenge will be how UN deal with the primary and very fundamental conceptual issues and particularly the principle that even has always tried to up 
after. However, the future of the current and the future operation doesn't seem like that 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 you know, um, we will be able to do that, or there will be more challenges in that context. So we are talking about transformation, and transformation of the UN missions also uh, provided some very interesting challenges. First of all, uh, you know, it, it, it provided it created new kind of natures of conflict in uh, various conflict hotspots, mostly in Africa, what we see in the 21st century. But at the same time, it also uh, provided uh, very interesting um, uh, ways of thinking or at the same time challenges we may say for the contributing countries who are contributing the troops and police forces as well. Now, if we see the opportunities, of course, the entire paradigm of uh, you know, training, orientations, um, knowing about the new context and being deployed over there has opened up a very wide open, um, uh, very wide and interesting experience for the troops and police forces and others who are, who are deployed over there. But at the same time, when the mandates were expanded due to these uh, robust missions and um, uh, uh, due to the multi-dimensional missions, particularly protections of civilians were incorporated, apparently this has already become a very established norm, but contextualize this norm of protection of civilians has opened up a lot of challenges for the contributing countries as well. As um, General Officer was talking about, that um, putting the troops in front of the line of fire was a very significant challenge, and we have seen a very interesting shift in the contributions from the global north to global south during these very interesting change of the norm when protection of civilians, maintaining law and orders, those things were, were implemented. And, and, and another very important crisis and challenges that were identified in the peacekeeping scholarship is that how this transformation from uh, in, in the context of contribution from global north to global south in the 21st century operation does not really reflect in the formulation of the mandate. That means the mandates are still formulated, uh, dominated by the delegates from the global north in the global platforms, uh, and, and that is implemented by, uh, by, by the troops and contribut contributions from the global south. So where is the compatibility over there as well? Of course, uh, the representation in the UN headquarters and other policy making platforms have increased probably in the last 10 15 years, but still there is an interesting dilemma or incompatibility between formulation of the mandates and how the mandates will be implemented as opposed to when and who are implementing the mandates. I think um, this is something that we need to also understand. Um, there's another interesting dilemma regarding. Uh, the, the nature of the conflict or the correlation between how peacekeeping operations has contributed in uh, stopping the relapsing of the conflict in the particular areas. Uh, there are Stockholm International Peace Research Institute data which says that in the last 50 years, uh, peacekeeping forces, where peacekeeping forces were deployed, there are, uh, it, has, it has declined or it has stopped uh, the possibilities of relapsing into conflict uh, almost three four times than the previous one. That means that three four countries, uh, there were possibilities that would have been relapsed into conflict because of the peacekeeping operation, it has not had happened. But what are those one four uh, possibilities of the cases? That's quite interesting for us. And of course, Mali is going to be one of those countries, or democratic Republic of Congo are uh, the other countries as well. So we have also had the success stories of the interventions. Even interventions, even force interventions over there as well. But there were one foot two country case studies where, where conflict has clearly relapsed. Or conflict has never really stopped because conflict has changed their patterns in that particular context. So that is something that we need to understand and particularly to other really very important. From 2020 onwards, particularly um, the crisis in Europe, the Russia Putin war, and even if you go back a little bit before that, in the context of Syria, where the United States was quite indecisive decision whether there is a need for a moment engagement in Syrian cases as well. So in those cases, particularly for the northern part of the world, and normally if you consider there is a much more aspect, which gives us an understanding that the great power is the big power politics in certain hotspots are getting 
um, you know, more attention in the UN Security Council. And when we talk about coercive diplomatic actions or some kind of solutions from the UN Security Council, because whenever we talk about UN missions, we have to also look at the UN Security Councils as well. So in those cases, I think, you know, this, uh, you know, reemergence of, um, um, you know, big power politics in different hotspots also probably, uh, uh, create uh, some challenges for United Nations, particularly to think about uh, you know, uh, deploying a UN force. Uh, if and particularly the exercise of veto power, potential veto power might also be at a stake over there. So, for example, uh, you know, if you compare the case of Mali, and as it has been mentioned already, uh, so I'm not going to repeat, but at the same time, if we compare what has been happening in Sudan, where in Sudan we have both regional extra regional powers were quite interested to resolve the issue or continue the issue as it is to solve it locally. Therefore, there is an impediment for the United Nations to get it involved into that. And this is the model which is getting more popular rather than requesting United Nations or having a consensus in the Security Council for the UN to be intervened, either in the format of a bigger uh, force uh, mission or as a special political mission. So this is a challenge for those who are always in favor of the United Nations to get engaged to resolve the conflict. Nevertheless, from 2013 onwards, if we look at the pattern, and that is probably the reason why Sun has mentioned that from 2014 onwards, we didn't have a new mission by the United Nations. That is because the model that we have been following or we have been observing since 2013 onwards after the Syrian crisis is that UN Security Council has been quite indecisive. And there are there are, there are powerful countries who are themselves indecisive in, in, in coming into a consensus uh, that how they would like to engage the United Nations to resolve the conflict. Now, you can translate these uh, as a failure and you can translate, you can, you can explain these that uh, whether there is a lack of confidence on the United Nations mechanism, that is one issue, or you can also see that this is merely a power politics in, in different parts of the world, therefore, they would like to resolve things the way how initially it was thought that French led AFISMA operation probably solved 90% of Mali's situation and even go there and keep the peace and continue the peace. But unfortunately, that has not happened. So, regional contribution in African places did not really get very good uh, results in that format as well. Finally, I think. You know, uh, on a positive note, because I personally am a very positive and pro United Nations engagement in conflict resolution. So, from that perspective, I think, you know, this is one of the most, this is means that UN Peacekeeping Endeavor is one of the most UN's uh, creative and innovative enterprise so far as it has been. We cannot deny the fact that the United Nations, because of its peacekeeping operations, has faced challenges, but it has created wide open opportunities. For the countries where the where the conflicts were resolved, and for the contributing countries of creating this entire global peacekeeping force who could intervene into a different country, and intervene perhaps is not a proper word, but okay. uh, engage into conflict resolutions and more conflicts okay. were raised. And this is also a learning experience for contributing countries like us because peacekeeping is a significant normative factor for countries of. You know, talk to contributing countries like Bangladesh. So we have also had long um, you know, learning experience from this, uh, from this local um, you know, uh, experience that we had. So we we accommodated the global experiences and localized it and it helped it to 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 resolve a conflict in in, in uh, different places. The ultimate issue is, I think there is a significant need of political will from the permanent members and also all the other members of the Security Council and also at the General Assembly. Because of course, peace building is the long-term sustainable uh, uh, intervention, but to ensure or to start a peace building approach, one has to definitely be sure that the previous stages like peace enforcement and peacekeeping has to be successful. Otherwise, there will be a resurgence on the basis of uh, the territory of Iraq and Afghanistan, although these are not even cases in that context, because if peace building is, uh, if it needs to be applied successfully, the peace enforcement has to be successful. And there must be a political will of both the international, regional, and local actors uh, to resolve the crisis politically. Otherwise, the technocratic approach of employing more technology, sophisticated technology, uh, uh, and others, which are also very 
aim of the cell share, but we are perhaps alone in so far. This is thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, and you rightly point out about the the link between mandate and capacity, which has been a problem for many, many years, especially because of the fact that the mandates are dictated by countries in the north or powerful countries like the P5s, and the mandate is implemented by third world countries who sometimes don't understand the mandate very well or lack the capacity to implement the mandate. So this has been a consistent problem. We are also observing that in many places the evolution is also going away from large-scale UN operations to more locally run operations or regional operations. And that perhaps is the way peacekeeping operations will go in the future. That is a trend we are seeing very clearly. So we have many other issues to discuss and there are very many aspects of peace, even peacekeeping that needs to be brought to the table. So for that, we will now open the floor for any questions and comments and observations. Please feel free to ask any question to the panel or to a particular speaker. We will first start with Ambassador Shamim, who has been uh, with peacekeeping operations as a deputy PR in New York, so he has had long experience of issues of peacekeeping. The best of you the floor. Yeah, thank you, General Rizaman. Thanks for the short intro on me, and that's the reason I've taken the floor. And that has uh, created me, in me some uh, compelling interest in human peacekeeping matters. I was, as you say, the deputy permanent representative of Bangladesh at the Eagle Mission in New York. 1997 to 2001, four years. Part of it was also spent on peace matters as a delegate of Bangladesh to the UN Security Council, but we remember. Uh, I will make a few points here. Uh, first, uh, thanks to the panel discussions for their excellent presentations. And uh, Dr. Zahar Chaudhary and both uh, folks of Hafiz has cited some, a few uh, successful event peacekeeping operations. But I've been, he, uh, I was so surprised, but I just noticed that they have been mentioned the case of East Timor, the, the peacekeeping mission in the, uh, it was UNMET. And I remember when uh, the program started, the observance mission was uh, headed by a Bangladesh military he made a very good name there. And uh, he, as a part of the peace building process, the Eastern Mission also took many civilian administrators and a good number of uh, Bangladesh civilian uh, civil service people who faced the problem of the Eastern to be employed for a uh, period. I would also like to know from uh, particularly Dr. Zakatra, who he was done in New York twice. Uh, the budgetary constraint that the peacekeeping operations face. I remember when I was there, the, the American contribution was 27 plus percent, which was later reduced to 25. And possibly America's uh, budget contribution to the regular budget of the is possibly 24 to 25, which is again, it was at that end of the Jesse Helms of the And now, uh, Uh, another thing that uh, maybe General Hafiz can uh, also throw right on, beside Dr. Zakat Chaudhary, the case that we've been pursuing the UN Secretary, with regard to senior appointments, senior appointments at the DBK, I don't think we have had even at the level of assistant secretary at the DBK. Uh, these are important for him. I did, that is not a convention of the, the number of senior positions that we have had at the peacekeeping mission. And the CMO across the month, across the month. And uh, uh, well, while uh, referring to the, the mission that was said, both success and failure, I would, I would, I would uh, 
uh, refer to one or two such vision, which doesn't underline the idea of success, but it just maintained the status quo. One is in, in Palestine, which is one of the oldest. Another one of the oldest is Unmuqir. Another is Unmuqir, the, the observer's mission in, on, on the Kashmir LOC. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Shemim. One of the aspects of uh, peacekeeping should be adaptation. And adaptation should be locally man needed and mandated. Uh, I would like to share with you my personal experience of Umtag in Cambodia, which is considered to be uh, the first multi dimensional operations of modern times. And it's a mission that carried out its mandate, but with adaptation. Because uh, when we finished Umtag, uh, the elections that were held was not accepted by the conflicted parties. So they even had a choice either of going back to square one or accept both the parties as winners. So what they even did was we ended up having two prime ministers in one country. So they were co-prime ministers. So we had Hun Sen, who is still continuing, and Prince Ranari was the winner. Hun Sen was not the winner, but they even sort of adapted to the situation so that the mission does not fail and we don't go back into relapse into conflict. The second adaptation was the US Secretary, uh, Security Council, through his resolution 880, launched another mission in Cambodia for stabilization sustenance. And I was again fortunate that I I was selected by the Security Council to head that mission. So we had a political security apparatus to look at the stabilization process of Cambodia for the next one year, which was unique to a UN mission concept. So in the current context, it is also required that even adapts to particular situations and the process of adaptation can lead to success. Thank you. Ambassadors, you have the floor. That is Please, microphone. Gentlemen, like you, I am very pleased to be involved with UTAG while I was in New York. And that was the first big Bangladeshi of the peacekeeping operation over involving 1,000 personnel. That's a big thing. The first one. And the first one. And uh, like this PNG, uh, Papua Bangladesh was involved and where civilians were there. And one of the elders, we have talked about success and failure. One of the biggest failures of the UN, uh, UN peacekeeping was Sevedan Singh, Bosnia Herzegovina, where the UN do and made fail to protect the Bosnia and Muslims. It's a very tragic story. And for Bangladesh, the number of peacekeeping operations were many others, and they are success stories of Bangladesh. It's in Namibia, UN mine keeping sweeping operation in Kuwait, and this success story and various other things are hard to be able to feel about Mali. Sometimes, unless that is political way, it cannot be. Peacekeeping operation have to be violent. And backing of P5 is very important because all peacekeeping operations, both financially and politically, come from the P5. So their role is vital. And while third world countries they provide the super duties, we have little say in that. Thank you very much to the panelists for their wonderful support. Thank you. Yeah. Just a microphone. Please introduce yourself. Sir. Thank you very much, sir. I'm here by Sanshan Mahmoud, the same guy. I first of all would like to thank all the presenters for giving such a comprehensive understanding of what peacekeeping operation is and what Bangladesh is doing by way of peacekeeper. Uh, sir, I would like to share my own experience. First one was in the former Republic of Yugoslavia, and the second one was a Democratic Republic of Congo, like say for example, Dr. Ithikar mentioned about Samuel Beckett's waiting for Godot. In fact, in DRC, there is still 
waiting for the peace. Uh, as a peacekeeper from Bangladesh, what we learn, in fact, uh, there are many dimensions to peacekeeping. One of the dimensions is the aspect of military operations. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, there were three elements. One element came from pa Pakistan, the other element came from India, the third element came from Bangladesh, and the Bangladesh element constituted two independent units. One was the Air Force unit, the other one was the military unit. The strange thing about that was that whenever we conducted an operation, these operations were combined operations, which means that when we flew the aircraft to extract the Bangladeshi troops from a difficult place, then we had Pakistani troops on board to support them. And on top of that, it was the Indian Air Force which provided the cover, something which is very unusual and strange to think about especially in the circumstances of the political situation that obtains in the region. So as, as a peacekeeper, it, it enhanced my professional skill, which is undoubtedly of immense value to me, how to operate in a difficult place together. In fact, we find it rather difficult even in Bangladesh to operate together with the army or the navy. And we found it so easy to operate in Democratic Republic of Congo because of the commitment and because of the pride and prestige we wanted uh, to be demonstrated to the world as a peacekeeper. So this is the aspect which is from military operations point of view. The other aspect that I personally feel that was, is, was extremely important for me to learn was the geopolitical aspect. I will just in fact, uh, uh, defend uh, the ambassador for saying that in the former Republic of Yugoslavia we failed to bring peace. Uh, but the peace was brought at a heavy cost. When we were in the former Republic of Yugoslavia, at the United Nations headquarters, we also found that there was an office which was maintained by NATO. And that office was largely manned by the US offices. And uh, it will not be, in fact, uh, Wrong to say that in the end, it was the United States air power which brought peace in the former Republic of Yugoslavia. If you read the book Utility of Force, that demonstrates it so strongly. Which means that in a, if we consider peacekeeping operations from a geopolitical aspect, that it is the power of the P5 which is most important. At the end of the day, it is not the power of the P5. My personal opinion is the power of the United States of America. How much the United States is committed to contributing to that kind of peace operation in the uh, in the context. So it is not merely the peacekeeping which is important. With that, we also have the coercive power, which we call peace enforcement. So where the military operations come in. Now, my specific question with this kind of experiences that I have had, I say that peacekeeping operations are a very good learning experience for Bangladesh military from the military operational point of view, not from the geopolitical point of view, only uh, having to be introduced to the kind of politics that go on, because we also saw the role that the French played negatively in the Democratic Republic of Congo. My specific question is to Dr. Nilak Ranjul, is that do you feel that uh, in the understanding of uh, bigger prospect of the peacekeeping operations, there needs to be more research conducted amongst the academicians, diplomats, and the soldiers and the military. This is first point. Said, do you feel, to Dr. Ethesar, that there is a necessity to include also the diplomats and the foreign office officers to be included in some of the elements of our peacekeeping units? Thank you, sir. Just a matter of clarification, Donald. The application of US air power Right. That was not part of the peacekeeping manual no. operation. That was a separate, no. separate application of US air power. Right. So I will just come to you, sir. I pose a question to Nirai. One of the weaknesses we see of UN operations on the ground is that lack of gender inclusivity. Only 8% of UN peacekeepers or UN police are from the gender aspect from the female. So with such imbalance in gender parity, operations sometimes don't go very well in countries that need 
some sort of gender balance of everything. So how can we improve that? So that's a question I'm posing to the law, please keep it up. We'll talk about it. Rusty of the floor. Hello, uh, I have a question which I'm going to answer. That uh, you have uh, told that uh, for 2000, there was no effort uh, taken to announce that this giving missions or we want to do it like that as it was earlier. Do you think that in the near future, uh, this very concept will die down, or is there any possibility that uh, the person will be uh, stronger countries or dominant countries will uh, support the giving uh, operations? The UN will not take any interest. As we are seeing that uh, just beside us in Myanmar, there is also so many things are happening. Nobody is doing anything. There is a uh, civil war like situation in Myanmar, and uh, Professor Vila has already put the city. Now, uh, I just give my few uh, personal experience, not as an NGO officer, as a journalist, what we saw in the Pacific mission. Actually, I declared in 1989 when the Pacific operations started in the world. I just, uh, so in 2002 and 2007, I was invited by Bangladesh Army to visit Sierra Leone and South Sudan to see the peacekeeping operations. Uh, when I went to Sierra Leone, it was just after the election was done. And uh, I found wherever I went, or the other journalists who went, we found that people were shouting, Bangla, Bangla, that is our Bangladesh. And they were so friendly to the Bangladesh Army, they were. Uh, Pakistan army, there were some of the Nigerian things. And same I saw in South Sudan. Major General Fazli Alayi Akbar, uh, was, a, was a prominent officer and he was the first commander there. When I went there, just before a few days he left. We made the, uh, say, rebels and the government parties support. And both of them were inquiring about him and they were full of praises. And actually, in these two countries, the Bangladesh played a significant role. They have uh, also provided medical facilities and other facilities. What I wanted to mean that what I saw there, that uh, it is if you just win the hearts and minds of the local people, whatever it might be, if you discuss and if you try to make them friendly uh, and behave friendly, then they listen to you. Bangladesh Army probably they could do it because they fought 24 years in the Tidaman villages and during the period. Our army had to uh, interact with the local population and uh, I, as an ex-member of Bangladesh Army, I can tell that our army can get pride on that, that without, uh, with minimum, say, casualties and other things or uh, some other incidences, our army could put down that insurgency in Chile and can be So now it is again popping up in a different, uh, that is a different issue. So, uh, General Hafiz has, has also told this thing, but it was a Wonderful experience seeing uh, even the Pakistan army. I saw the Indian army, I saw what he the service mentioned that I saw the Indian army and Bangladesh army were working together, jointly doing for the operations and uh, and so many things, providing so many facilities to the local people. Even Bangladesh army and Pakistan army working together. These were fascinating ex uh, experiences. But now we feel that in Mali, what is happening to so many of our soldiers was right there. There were so many uh, problems also. That uh, so far I know that uh, the ID proof uh, APCs were not provided in the, uh, in the course of time. So many of our soldiers came to the ID last. Uh, I don't know what happened there and what was the, let's say, what went wrong that people, some uh, financial uh, problem like that. However, uh, we hope that in the near future this investigation this will continue so that. Countries uh, are suffering now. Many countries are suffering now, like Myanmar, like Venezuela, like Syria, like you know, many countries just beside us. And we never know that when something will pop up in some places. We never knew earlier, say, six months back, that there will be something like that. But it's happening now in many countries. So we should be cautious. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rust. Yes. I'm just coming to you. I would like to pose as a moderator another question to we all know that in the fourth generation, technology is coming in a big way in all, all operations. So we are now beginning to see the use of drones. We are now beginning to see the use of robots in operations. 
there will be applications of AI and even operations. We are integrating satellite imagery as satellite intel in human operations. So it is a complete generational change in the way technology will be utilized in operations, particularly in the fourth generation. So how should countries of the third world, or the DCCs, should adapt, train, and equip themselves? There's a question to you, Nilal. Tohit, you have the floor. Mr. Tohit Hussain is our former foreign secretary. And you have a question. Thank you, Nilal. Uh, actually, uh, with so many people here, uh, with direct experience of uh, biscuiting, I thought I should have kept quiet, but uh, just uh, to say that the, the three exposures have been very educated, very educated. And I'm particularly uh, to say you of Hafiz, uh, who's like my younger brother anyway, for his very frank, realistic, and um, I would say somewhat unconventional presentation. Uh, he has brought out the problems that are there. It's very easy to praise that you know, he's done this good, etc., etc. But you have to go into the, uh, for uh, the real results, for the, uh, particularly when you think about the road ahead, you have to go into uh, details, which he has, he has done. Um, I'll just point out one or two things. As, um, Angola and Mozambique have been mentioned as success of the Episcopi. We think Episcopi, the problem in Angola did not uh, end. It ended when Zora Savimbi was killed after the again started war, and then only the, uh, really some sort of peace has been uh, restored there. Um, Mozambique, the uh, Ferimo uh, is ruling the country, and uh, the Renault still has its, uh, you know, military power in camps towards the, uh, in the, in the northern region, and the system was some sort, on some sort of Plenty. The government pays them all to the Renamo so that they keep quiet. And when there is any shortage of funds, they again start uh, getting a little bit trouble. And then there is some negotiation and some money is again paid to them. This, the, the problem remains. It, it has not really, really been uh, resolved. Um, well, uh, even uh, Yamuni, uh, ultimately, what has it led to? The, we had two winners, and the real winner has now been actually ousted. So, but anyway, that may not be the mandate of the uh, of the UN, UN at all. Somehow, uh, a patch up job. DRC, well, uh, all these countries I have been to, including DRC. And uh, I went to DRC for tourism, and people thought that I am mad. Um, it's actually many countries. DRC is not one country. Uh, the feeling that I got there. Uh, the two biggest cities, Kinshasa and uh, Lubumbashi. I flew from Kinshasa to Lubumbashi. Uh, there is virtually no road to connect these two places. I just saw the kilometers apart. Not to speak of the extreme east. So I think uh, unless these things are picked, Taken into consideration, the inherent reasons for the conflicts are attended to. This will just be, uh, you know, uh, resolving the issue for a while and then again going into uh, going into conflicts. Justice and opportunity is very important because in most of the cases, this is not there. There is extreme corruption in each of these countries. Deprivation is there and. There is a system of the winners take all. For the others, there is nothing in there. So the, the seed of conflict remains, and uh, I don't know how much you are discussing and do about that. Thank you. Thank you, Tohit. And I think you're right that uh, in many cases, the basic seeds are not uprooted. It is a difficult process, and sufficient political commitments to be made if we won't make that. In the case of Mozambique, I think it's a local adaptation that you keep the peace in the way you can su succeed. And it has, uh, in some ways, maintained peace. And very interestingly, Mozambique was also an operation led by a Bangladeshi force commander. 
Jim Salam. So we have had <coughs> contribution in many successful operations, which that we should take pride of. Shafat, use the floor. Uh, thank you. I want to again add my own personal thanks to the three panelists for the brilliant exposition. And once again, my question is to Professor Nilroy. I want to expand on your point about the, I would say, the relapse of geopolitical competition and the impact that it will have on peacekeeping. One of the reasons that UN peacekeeping prospered in the 90s after a general for peace by the first was because we were also enjoying the peace debate. If you just look at the amount of money and interest the United States took or spent during the 90s during the Clinton administration on UN peacekeeping operations, whether in terms of military education and training, whether in terms of the investment, or in terms of their deployment, there was quite a significant US presence in Intel, for example. Uh, or the fact that China, as it emerged as a newly emergent power, was taking a really strong interest in peacekeeping operations. We had Russian peacekeepers in Intel. We had Russian peacekeepers in UNLT, the other mission that General Kisaman talked about. But with the uh, sort of remission of geopolitical competition, uh, I'm very keen to hear your take because I personally am I'm fearful of whether you will be speaking will actually get affected because uh, the consensus will also get affected. My second question is to Dr. Chaudhary. Uh, so if I recollect, it was during your time as permanent representative that Bangladesh first posted a defense attaché of the UN permanent mission. I think it's going to be a general <coughs> And uh, one of the things that I think uh, we often see in it, that whether we need to take a fresh look at the political military interface in Bangladesh, which deals with peacekeeping. For instance, do we need to have a military advisor or somebody of equivalent rank in MOFA? Or uh, how can we improve the interface between AFT and MOFA on the way where we can lobby for um, greater senior appointments? Data footprint in peacekeeping operations because it is an unfortunate reality that despite such a large uh, deployment uh, in peacekeeping operations, our share of senior appointments is very low. Well. At the moment, I think we just have one post commander in or so. We have one post commander in the area, but uh, we are not getting the kind of senior appointments that we deserve. So, is there a way we could perhaps take a fresh look at our political military interface? And I would be very keen to hear your take on that. Thank you. Yes, you see. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, well, having heard uh, all the lead speakers and also uh, other you know, points raised by participants, uh, one thing uh, I was just wondering that we have spoken or shared our experience, and I'm sure that um, I have the experience also in the development. But I'm not well in that particular area. Uh, why is UN peacekeeping operations uh, always come in the limelight during the election season? And uh, I would like to hear from our learned uh, and former advisor, Dr. Victoria, General, and including yourself, and Professor, why this comes up as something uh, which is of concern to politicians, the armed forces, the people, the military personnel. Uh, this is not the subject, uh, you know, we talk in the UN peacekeeping. But Bangladesh is very much involved. Even though the UN uh, uh, peacekeepers have a uh, little shady reputation of scandals, corruption and whatnot, but Bangladesh is uh, too much involved, including health issues, uh, which used to be the of your uh, AIDS period. And now it has declined since you know, medicine things have come up. But Bangladesh should never, uh, you know, in this area. Uh, these are mainly, uh, I think, the, the, the other other people who have been criticized. But why, you know, it is so important. Our, our forces have done very well. But why, in our national interest, this plays a very important role, and uh, you know, we, we we take it very seriously in this particular issue. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Any other question? Yes, please. Please introduce yourself on the last question. Thank you, 
Yes, sir. Uh, so my name is Rubaiyat Sanju. I am a lecturer at Bangalore Bishop Mohan Mohan Medical University. I teach Medical Institute of Strategic Studies there. <coughs> so I was listening to uh, uh, Mr. sir, and he had mentioned that since 2013, no uh, new mission, uh, peacekeeping mission, has been approved by the United Nations Security Council. So my question is, uh, do you think uh, that it has, it is somehow uh, related to the, the rise of uh, private military contractors operating in African continent, especially uh, what we have seen uh, Russian Russian uh, PMC like the Wagner Group, which is also active in Ukraine, and also in Sudan, uh, DRC, in other parts of Africa where the conflict is going on. So, uh, is it because uh, that one United Nations Security Council permanent member has somehow an indirect stake at maintaining this conflict by supporting one party against another? That uh, we are seeing that no uh, new approvals are very difficult uh, to uh, to make in, uh, in the United, United Nations Security Council. And if this thing is going on, I mean, the uh, one United Nations. Uh, Security Council's permanent member is uh, indirectly involved itself in this uh, conflict dynamics. Uh, what do you see the future of this peacekeeping mission and how do you think this will evolve uh, in the next few years? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. If, uh, I'll again go back to the Lord. Please don't mind. Ask, ask too many questions to you. I'd like to understand what is our capacity in Bangladesh in interpreting the mandate and analyzing it from political military angle before we accept to go to a mission. And also going back to Shabdat's point that he raised, what is our interface between the diplomats and the soldiers? in understanding what we really have to do. And also in the post mission, how should you analyze from the diplomatic point of view, what you achieved, and from the military point of view, what we have achieved on the ground, operationally. Are we having the sufficient interface between our foreign office and our other military headquarters? Or if not, what should you do? This is a question again to both you, Dilaw and Dr. Chaudhary. So, if there are no other questions, we we'll like now like to go back to our panelists to, for them to give their response. And we'll start with Dr. Chaudhary. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone around the table: Shamim, uh, Nazmullah, Mahmoud, Rush, Tohid, Shafat, Shahid, and others. Shamim, for for your your contributions and, and your questions. Um, so uh, I, I would not attribute the uh, the, uh, the uh, responses to any specific question, but broadly I think these are your right to respond to what you with my colleagues uh, from the Foreign Office uh, have been raised. Yes, uh, budgeting is extremely important, extremely important, and it is also important because it it sort of defines the nature of the politics of this debate. One of the, many of the questions raised were what is the Remember that this is uh, it is in sync with the nature of geopolitical development around the world. Peacekeeping was, I think, especially Shafat, but during the, the, the uh, whole war period, particularly during the Islam period, when the conflict was confined to territories which were identifiable and usually in a civil conflict situation, and that the big fellows uh, did not have. Too much of an axe to grind in the result. So, we have very smooth funding from everywhere. Now, remember, the US Congress is not going to fork out $2 billion, nearly $2 billion a year for something that they do not see the American people or their representatives who are actually paying for it, benefiting in some ways as a furtherance of a US purpose or goal. I mean, that, that's why one of the goes without saying. Uh, so, Eventually, I see a point in time when the conflict becomes wider than merely civil conflicts, and the big fellows themselves get involved. Where is it happening to grain? And if it happens in Taiwan, for instance, where do you keep peace? I mean, these are developed societies where the fighting, the conflict will go on, and they don't need peace building and they need grain, and they don't need peace building in Taiwan. So, the nature
nature, uh, as I have talked of the Heraclitus concept of flux. Yes. Even then, we have more conceptual developments and further, like in, a, 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 in the sort of tactical uh, postures, in also thinking how do you address post conflict? And that was what Duhan Dalton was talking about. Eventually, when the conflicts of the East Pass of the end of the Vietnam period of the, of, 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 the, uh, of the Cold War, and you have a new hot war period where the protagonists are uh, America, China, European Union. Then, who funds what? You see, uh, so that is that is one very major problem we have. With what we already have, the problem is we need to talk of interfacing. Uh, 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 of course, it, it's easier to interface in the configuration of the law uh, because uh, there you are operating with your own military advisors and the UN system. Uh, uh, in, 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 in headquarters, you see the kind of uh, 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 you know. The background support that you give, uh, it becomes very difficult because we really don't know where the source of policy is, whether it's in the AFD or whether it's in foreign affairs or whether it is now in the national security advisor. I would assume that I would assume that they would think in terms of it. I mean, the most uh, uh, the common sense answer is a is, is, is board unit to advise the policy maker, whether it's the national security advisor or the foreign minister, who is the ultimate determinant of, of the policy position. This, this regard. Uh, I see some uh, 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 dangers okay, conceptually in peacekeeping continuing as as uh, as is as is. This is almost surely bound to evolve as global politics changes and we go from a life. Uh, bipolar uh, uh, world of government conflict to a multipolar world of active conflict. So where the change these changes will happen, and uh, we should either think out of the box uh, with regard to those now, or, 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 or I mean, uh, you know, there, there's no way the United Nations can sign off from this effort, from, sign off from this effort, and uh, this is what I think developing countries should bring uh, uh, to bear pressure on the United Nations, because at the end of it all, Peacekeeping as we know it today, and peacemaking as peace, uh, peace building, is, a, it is something that redounds to the benefit of developing countries in conflict situations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chudri. We'll now go back to Jim Hafiz for his moments. Uh, thank you very much, sir. A, 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 a lot of uh, interesting uh, questions and issues have been, been raised, but I'll, I'll just try to, try to respond or try to address only only a few of them because there are other speakers who, who are better placed. Uh, first, uh, there was a there was a question raised from Captain Amrushd. Captain Amrushd uh, is a person who is to be uh, frequently seen in the media in the past, but I don't know why why he is not seen in the media. So I'd like to ask him why he is so silent in the, in the media. Okay, okay. <laughs> jokes jokes apart, uh, jokes apart. You have mentioned about the uh, there has been no enhancement of uh, UN peacekeeping missions since 2013-14. Uh, so the, uh, the right statement would be there has been no deployment of large-scale multi-dimensional UN peacekeeping since 2014. The last multi-dimensional peacekeeping was in Central African Republic in 2014. So for the last nine years, the United Nations has not ventured into any peacekeeping operation. Now there are there are two things. One, one thing has not been discussed in this in, in this roundtable. That is, whatever the Security Council, wherever the Security Council wants to deploy the P5, where it, there is an unanimity of the P5, plus four from the remaining nine, there has to be nine votes. So, so in a sense, the P5 has to agree to deploy any peacekeeping involvement, whether you call it intervention or not. I will not use the term intervention with, with, with this case. So, since 2014, it's plain and simple, the P5 has not agreed. There has not been any unanimity among the permanent five to deploy any peacekeeping. Even though there were some talks of a peacekeeping mission in Syria, it has not happened. There were discussion about a peacekeeping uh, presence in eastern Ukraine in 2017-18. The Russians and the Americans officials were discussed. 
There was a discussion of, uh, of a peacekeeping deployment in Yemen. There was a civil war that raged in Yemen for seven years, killing hundreds of thousands of people. Yes. It, it, it was a humanitarian catastrophe of uh, unbearable proportion, but there is no military deployment. So one thing is the P5 is to agree. So we will not go into the politics of P5, there is friction. But the mission in Mali, the lessons, uh, all the lessons of, of our 75 years of peacekeeping learning has been proven wrong through what is happening in Mali since 2013, since the deployment of your mission. All, all, all the learnings that, has, that we have assimilated from the uh, peacekeeping experience, Mali has proven everything wrong. Now, in 2013, uh, we usually know that there is friction in uh, there is friction in among P5 fragmentation among P5 between Russia and China on one side and the P3 on the other side, the UK, France, and US. In Mali, interesting, there is friction between US and France. Last year, two P5 two, two P5 members they abstained. So the, the, the extension that we are having in Mali, uh, which is ending on 30th June, two of the P5 members, China and Russia, abstained. It passed. Usually, with regard to the peacekeeping missions in Africa, there is a kind of kind of agreement or unanimity among P5 in Africa. But in Mali, it proved to be wrong. We, from the very beginning, US disagreed on many aspects because this, this, the situation was not conducive for a peacekeeping operations since 2013. And we are going to see in about seven days, in about a week, whether this mission is going to be extended or not. And we have, we have, we have, we have seen extension of uh, DRC even though it has not yielded its success in the last uh, 20 years or so. But in Mali, it is going to be an interesting case in point. And within a week, we are going to see whether it is going to stay as it is. There are, two op there are three options. One is ruled out. At, at the the first, uh, first one is totally ruled out, which is uh, uh, enhancement of the strength of, of the peacekeeping force. That is ruled out. The second is, as it is, whatever whatever the peacekeeping force, 13,000 strong, will remain with certain reconfiguration of the deployment. And the third is withdrawal of the peacekeeping force and replacing it with a special political mission. So we are not sure what is going to happen. But my point here is, that if, if the P5 is not in agreement on any mission, it will not, it's, not, it's not going to happen. This is one. The other thing, even if they agree, they have to find TCCs to go there. It's very interesting. Uh, uh, we agreed, Bangladesh agreed in 2030 to go to Mali as a troop contributing country. Pakistan, India, they are they remain within within five. You didn't go. There is no, there is no presence of Indians in, in Mali, no presence of Pakistanis in Mali, and I believe no Nepal is there. They are, these three countries are competing with Bangladesh. They didn't go to Mali for the very reason that it is, it is not peacekeeping. The second point I'd like to touch. Uh, uh, so I, I think I have answered your your, your question on this, and uh, uh, the second thing is about senior appointments in DPKO. Uh, very rightly pointed out, uh, we, we have been uh, uh, top most contributing country for a long, long time. First or second, we there has been no one from the Bangladesh military as as the uh, military advisor to the SG. Neither deputy, uh, nor nor military advisor, uh, neither uh, deputy military advisor. We had force commanders uh, in the field. Uh, yes, a number of force commanders have been there. Uh, and why we haven't got uh, the position of the of the military advisor and uh, the deputy military advisor is it's, it's, it's very interesting that uh, that uh, in, in a number of Bangladeshi senior officers they uh, they competed for this, these positions uh, but they didn't get to. So I don't go into the the larger debate of the, the political military debate at the DPKO and in the ASG uh, secretariat, but that is the fact. So. Uh, I don't know if uh, I have to. Uh, I have to answer any other any other queries or, or things. Thank you, Afiz. Uh, you very rightly pointed about the difficulties of the Mali mission, which we should be seeing observing over the next one week about the UN Security Council decision. Mali mission had a very unique operation of counterterrorism, which proved to be extremely difficult to implement on the ground. 
this is not a classical role of peacekeepers. So now that the host government has asked the Security Council to withdraw the peacekeepers, we have to wait for another week and see what happens to the fate of the mission. Deloy, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, thank you, sir. Um, I think there, there are some questions, particularly I would also like to hear Hafiz sir, particularly the last question which was asked by Bolisama um, sir on the political military interface, particularly how, particularly the post-mission experience, so how we have utilized our our, our experiences in the missions uh, within the country. Um, but, you know, I, 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 you know I, I, can, I can answer some of the other questions which has been raised, particularly um, one question was about um, the uh, situations of uh, gender parity, uh, gender balance. Uh, so, there is an interesting concept for women, peace, and security, which we all understand. We are seeing much which is in 25. Bangladesh has um, adopted its national action plan in 2019. Um, so, Foreign Affairs, Armed Forces, Station of Bangladesh, who is jointly uh, hosted that national action plan. After that, we are, uh, in Bangladesh as a contributing country, is also. Uh, interested to comply with some of the indicators that have been mentioned regarding to force uh, the participation of women in peacekeeping operations. We have been doing quite good so far as the, uh, the, the commissioned officers that is in the military and also in the, uh, in the police forces as well. So one issue that we have to struggle regarding the national action plan and targets that we have been set up is to also comply with the non-commissioned officers. So for in, in the troops, I think from 2019 there was female engagement team uh, who were who were recruited before that they met criteria and they were some the missions and later on the engagement team was also uh, formulated which is the, the mixture of female and males in the contingents in the non commissioned levels. Uh, so yes, Bangladesh is complying or trying to comply in the process of compliance with the uh, gender balance uh, issue, women peace and security issues, those authority issues. has also localized by forming the institutional mission. There are one or two challenges because our force situation has done a study recently and, and the results suggest that one of the important issue as challenge for women's participation in these operations is of course the social uh, and gender dimension of the rules and understanding is a very local issue. So there is a need for awareness for women uh, to include in the security forces and also in the um, uh, in the peacekeeping operations, which is of course a social rule, just not only the rules of the forces, but the law in the context of that. So technology has been a very important issue um, in, in the peacekeeping affairs. Of course, when we find fourth generation, uh, fourth generation peacekeeping, we also talk about technology a lot. We have experienced the introductions of unmanned aerial vehicles. We have also you know, seen the experience of uh, the use of the satellite forces in surveillance as well. Um, so this has uh, obviously created a lot of opportunities to uh, increase the use of technology in the peacekeeping operations. Of course, there are a lot of efficiency, particularly in information collections at the same time, um, you know, utilizing, um, utilizing the forces and uh, utilizing the technologies uh, to enhance the efficiency of the, of the tasks, of the mandates. At the same time, it also raised some very interesting questions. For example, uh, you know, who controls the technologies are very important questions, and who controls the information that are collected from the technology. There are studies which have shown that in Africa, where uh, you know more uh, sophisticated technologies has been used uh, to collect information, uh, so that is a question that who will control the final repositories of this information and how those will be utilized. The contributors, the force contributors, the top troop and police contributors like us and others, they in most of the cases, they I mean in the recent times, for example, you know that some countries have to procure some of this information, some of these technologies and utilize that as part of their uh web list system. But still those technologies are controlled by the technologically developed and western countries. Therefore the information that are collected are also reported under the controls of those countries who have the capability to utilize those technologies. Now the issue here comes in that this is a big data which will come in, of course, at one point of time. For example, if when a country controls big data, the country have the monopoly over one point of the issues. Now if UN doesn't have the control of of of, 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 of the big data that is collected from the countries where the country is ongoing, who else will be controlling that? So that may 
raise an issue of or an ethical issue of utilizing technologies in the, in the forefront. Therefore, the United Nations, so far as now, is enthusiastic of utilizing sophisticated technologies, but at the same time, there is a gray zone between, between the way how a uh, developed country utilizes technologies in the military affairs versus the United Nations utilizes technologies, uh, which is mostly for the information collections. Um, um, uh, in, in this condition, so so it is it is an important issue for us for the for the future peacekeeping operations. But at the same time, the critical issues of utilizing technology and the end line of utilizing the information is, will, will be a question as well for us in future. Finally, I think the geopolitical issue has been addressed quite a lot. Mr. Perkins has raised this issue, and this is very significant. I think the political will and the P five which you have mentioned and this is quite significant. Um, still now, what probably doesn't need to be uh, like very optimistic or practically optimistic in terms of thinking that that can be true. Based peacekeeping operations will be obsolete in the future draft because of the geopolitical complexities and changes. It's 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 some to some extent it is true, and uh, particularly after the 2017 experiences what we have we have seen. But at the same time, I think what alternatives do we have as of now and for the future? Like you know, because there un unfortunately there will be conflicts and there will be interstate conflicts. Civilian conflicts. Now, of course, there needs to be a political consensus between the uh, regional or extra regional countries who are engaged into that conflict. Otherwise, it is difficult to bring United Nations or engage United Nations to a conflictual matter of the E5 and the four other non government members in the council. But what else? Like, we have seen examples where there is a lack of consensus between the Regional, extra regional powerful countries, and we have seen that United Nations Security Council have not been able to, to bring United Nations into that crisis. The conflict was ongoing, so the, or, the only alternative of not having United Nations in the in the in the entire you know, situation is the conflict will always be uh, there because we have also experienced that the local actors has not been able to resolve the conflicts in most of the cases. That includes Myanmar as well, or very well neighboring. So, someone from the external actors has to be engaged into there. And it can be a regional country, regional powerful country, and, and still the United Nations plays the hope for many cases that, and, and particularly one of the very important principles that is neutrality that the United Nations has been trying to maintain that. Yes, there were compromises on the issues of neutrality in many cases because in peace enforcement issues, it has been difficult. We have seen Mali and other cases as well. But having been able to create another alternative. Other than the United Nations, um, successful. Thank you. Yeah, just just to uh, address two points which uh, which were raised, but have not probably been included in the responses. Uh, about, one is Shahid's point about why uh, uh, election season for countries uh, comes to fall. That's because of the PTC politics and the, uh, the, the, the true problem with the countries are all developing countries like ours. Where uh, this is a source of revenue, source of revenue not just for the state, but for a significant component of the state system, which is the grid. And therefore, it obviously has a tremendous uh, um, political, economic, uh, financial significance. Uh, hence, uh, it's almost like one of the best of the factor uh, uh, we enjoyed uh, enjoy election season. The other thing I wanted to quickly explain the, the politics of the five as well. Sometimes we take them as, as one whole. Within the P5, actually, there are two categories. There is a P3, which is uh, uh, which is the European country, uh, which is UK, US, France, and of course uh, China and Russia. Within the P3, again, there's a great uh, interoperability between the US and the UK. But where France comes, France has some, certain subtly different positions. Particularly, it's very important because of those factors for the Africa. Now, France believes, even in the concept of peace building, France believes that military operations should have a single core military uh, purpose. Uh, broadening it to include uh, multi dimensional uh, uh, goals would uh, diffuse the military content of the operation and therefore erode the war fighting capability of troops. I and mean, that's a philosophical point the French take, and that's how they do it in Africa. 
Africa and elsewhere. So, in each of these deployments, there have been intense negotiations, forget China and, 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 and Russia, among the D3 the themselves, okay? so actually the two, two groups of, of, of the D3s. So, this is a, always an ongoing debate. All of them, every actor, every major actor, and, and the money contributors are certainly major actors, have, have certain philosophical points regarding many of with one another. And it's very difficult for the human system, which is not a bureaucracy, it's, a, it's more of a powerless bureaucracy than the bureaucracy, bureaucracy we have got. We know the bureaucracies in our country work very, very powerful, but it's not so in the United Nations. In the United Nations, the power of the bureaucracy in the United Nations has to be obtained by diplomatic negotiations with the United States, and that's not always the case. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, this has been a very rich discussion, and many aspects of peace can be involved. For the sake of time, I will not try and summarize this. I would only like to end our discussion today by expressing our gratitude to all Bangladeshi peacekeepers, past and present, and paying our homage to all foreign Bangladeshi peacekeepers. We acknowledge their contribution to maintaining some peace and stability around the world. I thank you all for your participation today in our own table. And we we'll hope to see you again next month in another strategic issue that we shall be discussing. Now, please join me in thanking our panelists for today for their wonderful presentations. <laughs> and may I now request you to join us for a cup of coffee outside. Thank you. Thank you.